Happy New Year! 2023 is over, and 2024 has forced its way into our homes and set up shop for the next 365 days. Or 364, this one's almost over. But the memory of 2023 still lingers. I know I'll still be writing it down for at least the next few months whenever I have to do paperwork. But I thought of doing a retrospective sort of video to celebrate the last year. The last year has been great. Just everything's been going really well. There's so many more comments, and so many of them are nice and invested. It's just been great. I just, it's, it's kind of hard to put it into words. I can write 10 pages of salt in a heartbeat, but I fumble when it comes to feelings. But it's just, it's been good. But there's been a lot of videos over the past year, so I decided to do this retrospective in a sort of clip show to catch up on some things. Initially, I was going to do like a best of video, and then I thought, hey, why not make a recap video of the most watched sections of every video? I then started looking through some of these most watched moments, and I can say with full certainty that the following video is going to have virtually no context, but I still hope it's fun. Also, some videos have more than one replayed scene. Uh, sometimes I'll add all of them, sometimes I won't. It depends on the context of the clips. Like, like if it's just me counting bears and it's clear there only is a lot of traction there because someone was skipping to that section, I'll skip it. But at least one scene per video. Each clip will have the title of the video they originated from and the date of release too, and I'll add commentary occasionally here or there if I think it needs it. One last note, so not all of these videos I had backups of, which yes, is very dumb, and I knew it and I still deleted a bunch of them when I went to go re-download Security Breach for Ruin, so some of them I had to re-download from YouTube. Most of the ones I re-downloaded were fine, but some of them, it looks like YouTube partially digested them. They're still talking, but they look a little mutilated. Normally, I would copy the audio and redo these scenes, but I wanted to get this video up today, so I must take the hit on my credibility. As though giving Ennard an 8 on the smooching list didn't already do that. As though making the smooching list didn't do that. Anyways, let's get to it. Narcissists and narcissistic parents have traits such as an inflated self-ego and a feeling of importance, a lack of empathy, and can be abusive, neglectful, or emo and emotionally manipulative. All of these fit William to a T, to his neglect of the crying child, to his physical abuse of Elizabeth, which is confirmed in the books. William's sense of importance and lack of empathy is pretty obvious as well. That's how he gets along making stupid decisions and still pretending that he's doing it on purpose. Something about all women William Afton has direct control over being dolled up in tight clothes, and posed in coy little positions feels kind of gross. And not in a Madness Returns way, where it was on purpose playing towards the themes. Baby and Vanny are made like this just to ogle at. Imagine the VIP fire ending, the rooftop escape, Freddy tackling Vanny off the roof, Gregory finding out the truth about who she is, and the only change is that the prize puppet is just there the entire time. No explanation why, he's just present. So here are the facts. As of right now, Mengel and Funtime Foxy are not canonically confirmed or denied to be the same person. However, we have possible evidence, well, I mean the voices, to suggest that these might actually be separate people. So there's that. What do I think? Uh, I guess I lean towards the separate animatronics because of the fact that Mengel and Funtime Foxy's roles have been shown to be so separate of one another. I know that conflicts with the books, but I I don't know. I don't know. Two purple men, two bites, two Charlies, two Vanessas, and now two Mangles. We're moving on. In fact, it wasn't until FNAF AR, years later, that we saw this crawling Ballora. See, there's this catch about Ballora. Behind that pretty face is a pretty terrifying monster. Though she is styled to be the most human, though she is elegant and poised, this doesn't make her any more approachable. In fact, Valora leans much more into Uncanny Valley than any of her bandmates, always standing out like an uncomfortable mannequin more than a beautiful ballerina. A technician climbs through a vertical pipe maze in the basement that shrinks the more you get down into it. Suspend your disbelief for this one, folks. I had less questions about the mystery of Amagara fault. It doesn't matter how jokey FNAF gets, these events still happen canonically in the story. 
Sister Location jokes about angsty teens and exotic butters. But three people are murdered and Michael Afton's life is ruined in a way that he can't ever escape. Pizzeria Simulator jokes about sending employees who know too much to an asylum. But yeah, that means Henry, who's pulling the strings in that game, was fully prepared to ruin some guy's life if he found his secret audio log that pretty much doesn't say anything incriminating. Security Breach constantly makes jokes, especially with the ditzy and goofy Freddy. Nine children have already died. The animatronics bury themselves underground and people know where they are, but they don't do anything. There's a pizzeria built underneath Charlie's house, no pizza plex required. There's also a giant cave with a waterfall, and Springtrap runs in and is like, This soup burns better. And leaves. Uh, in case you haven't seen the Simpsons episode, the joke is that it's an unneededly vague and convoluted pronoun game. Charlie finds a door and believes Sammy's in it, and John convinces her to leave without seeing what's inside. Then she rather suddenly is eaten by Freddy, everyone thinks she's dead, and then Charlie's sensual doppelganger rolls up outside the diner where they're eating and the book ends. That summary is exactly what it feels like to read the Twisted Ones. It's weird to look back at FNAF 1 and see how much has changed since then. We have had five generations of Freddy Fazbear's, not counting the nightmares and hallucinations. Freddy, once a plush and silent antagonist, has most recently been portrayed as Glamrock Freddy, a high-tech but lovably clueless father figure. Chica variations have evolved from yellow and orange plump chicks to lean, mean, white feather chicken ladies. Bonnie's still around, but usually plays second fiddle to the other bunny-shaped villains looming in the spotlight. New bandmates Roxanne Wolf and Monty Gator were added in Security Breach, adding in new colorful characters. Long gone is the puppet, here comes the sun and the moon and the space in between. Fazbear Entertainment crashing and burning and rising from the ashes only to burn again and again. We've seen plenty of promising faces come and go. And Foxy... Foxy hasn't changed. Music Man is currently the largest animatronic of all time, except maybe the blob, but considering that it's assumedly a bunch of pieces of animatronics, I think DJ can still retain the title of the largest single fully intact animatronic of the bunch. I can't stress how big this boy is. He also happens to mention the bite of 87. Here's what he says about it. Uh, they used to be allowed to walk around during the day too, but then there was the bite of 87. Yeah. It's amazing that the human body can live without the frontal lobe, you know? The reason I included this most viewed clip in particular is that I've gotten a handful of comments after the release of this video of people correcting me that it's the bite of 83, not 87. And I'm not sure if they meant the picture, which, if they saw the picture, then they must have seen the note where I said I was using the picture because there isn't a picture of the bite of 87, or if they're arguing that phone guy is wrong and he meant 83, in which case, I mean, I mean it's in the game. This is the man himself, the phone guy. I think he knows what he's talking about. If you happen to get caught and want to avoid getting stuck into a Freddy suit, uh, try playing dead. Spring Bonnie. Why is there such a big pause between the A and anyone? And why does it say a man was chased into the suit? You don't have to be vague, we get it confirmed that it's Afton, so why leave this up in the air? Also, again, absolutely no description about character, events in the game, etc. This is a character encyclopedia, it shouldn't be this brief and then have a whole page blocked up with pictures. Especially when the pictures aren't great. The Vanessa picture actually looks good, but the Vanny ones are pretty rough. Golden Freddy, oh god, that's an in-Russia joke. One of the hinges of the Is Vanessa Vanny plotline is this mislead of seemingly being innocent but actually being possessed and working with Afton. But it doesn't work with Vanessa because A, we already know the twist when we're going in, and B, we don't get enough of Vanessa to portray this as she is already portrayed as hostile in the first few moments of the game. And if that's not enough, we have moments where the game telegraphs it so hard that it just comes off as confusing. Vanessa is abrasive and harsh, even if you don't figure out that they have the same name, which you will because I think the subtitles are on by default, you will see her as antagonistic the moment she pops up. I'm not sure why this scene was most watched, so here's a bonus, the second most watched. Or perhaps have them both be subservient to Afton. She could be the other in the both of you. 
both hackers, both possessed, having them play out this good cop, bad cop routine so nobody catches on to the fact that they're playing on the same team. A great idea. Better than, oh, I don't know, child killer William Afton suddenly deciding to not kill a child because he's good at video games and that equates to being a super hacker. A child who just happens to have William's noticeable traits and will likely look somewhat like him after the questionable age gap between this game and the next one. And the bosses consist of Robo Chica work in progress. Ahead of a Chica robot with a floating cupcake, already ate Chica, an overstuffed Chica variant belching up all sorts of horrors, and the Chica Defense Network, a brain in a jar, surrounded by swimming cupcakes. Now, finally, we move on to Security Breach, where Chica all but went through her biggest change of the series. Well, sort of. I know it seems like this was probably most watched because people jumped to the Glamrock Chica section, but I know in my heart that they were really here for Already Ate Chica. Anyway, on to the Balloon World minigame. So, Balloon World works a lot like a knockoff Flappy Bird, except a little more forgiving. You play as Balloon Boy soaring through the sky while the sun smiles overhead, turning into the moon and back. Notably, once the sun turns into the moon, he carries his nasty grin even back in his sunny form. The secret hidden in this game can be found if you manage to snare a glitch. You go into a distorted world where the sun is replaced by his eclipsed form, and you must follow along a purple trail until you reach the end. But all I'm saying is, yes, Moon might just be legit evil. Moon might really be Afton and invading and infecting Sun and, and just hasn't reached the other personality. But this idea of being invaded by a parasite could be real. And that being said, the idea of the Sun and Moon being the next step in Afton's big scheme, well, I think... I think I hate it. In fact, the idea of the daycare attendant, a character I really latched onto, being another embodiment of Afton, yeah, I hate it. Like, I really, really hate it. So, don't assume my introduction to this idea is me vying for it. No, I legit do think it would be horrible. Especially if FNAF leaned into this because of the popularity of said daycare attendant. Obviously, not all of it would be because of that, since there were hints in there since launch, but I don't think doubling down would be a good idea. Because, I've gotta be frank here, I feel there's a pretty good amount of evidence showing that Sun and Moon could be influenced by Afton beyond the Vanny virus, and I feel like if you went that route, I think it would be a nobody liked that situation. Replace Afton glitch trap with Vanny, and I can almost claim that I call this an advance. I did at least nail down the destruction aspect, as both in Ruin and Help Wanted 2, you can see those dark scribbles on the broken staff bots in the daycare. You know, with the cut daycare attendant stuff, the fact that they were on the official release box art and the initial both of you will burn, I'm starting to wonder if Moon really was the accomplice to Vanessa. And don't say it was Gregory, why would Afton be telling Gregory to bring him Gregory? My... My New Year's resolution is to stop provoking myself into talking about how much I don't like GGY. So, moving on. They're uncomfortably human-like, even more so than Springtrap, and the addition of that silence in this context, and him always being there watching, getting closer the further you get into the game, paint a rather unsettling picture, especially after the tape makes it clear that he will do harm. Though technically Glitchtrap does have one unique line, it can be heard by editing the audio at the end of the Princess Quest minigame. This is the only William Afton line that ever unsettled me, and I think it's because of how it sounds. No doubt this glitch trap is just William, but it doesn't sound like him. It sounds like his voice, but in tone it carries none of that edge to it. It is flat and direct. It really is like something else replicating his voice. But what's the deal with it? Well, as the name implies, and as we can grasp by the Taco Tuesday sign outside the door in Security Breach, $99 for a taco platter? And I thought the $12 milkshakes were ridiculous. No wonder there's ATMs outside the front door. The chain specializes in Mexican food. Despite the larger name in the title, you don't play as Chipper himself, you play as Tyke, his son, as he took over the lumber company from his father. Which is probably for the best as established in the game, 
Chipper pretty much spends his life off in another galaxy. He's pretty detached from reality, about as smart as a plank of wood. And how he ran a successful lumber business on his own, considering he might have eaten his own wife on accident, we'll never know. There once was a man named Phineas Taggart. Taggart was a scientist studying haunted objects and animatronics, assumedly around Utah. Taggart didn't believe in so-called hauntings, and instead believed that toys and bots were brought to life with intense emotions and deemed the strongest emotion to be agony. Okay, I think it's obvious that this picture is the reason this was the most watched section. Let's pop down to the twist ending. They end up in the ball pit and hop inside. They realize there's a bunch of kids already in there. But they realize as well, by giving the kids good memories, they can help them move on. One by one, they help the children leave the ball pit, giving them pleasant memories to release their souls until the stitch race shuts down and it's just the two of them in the ball pit. The two friends realize it's time to rest. Jake offers Andrew to come with him and Andrew takes his hand. Finally, he has someone who's there for him and Jake can now finally be at peace. And they suddenly wake up. They're confused. Something's wrong. Something fell into the ball pit and woke them up. Jake and Andrew check in on each other. It's still them. They're still here. But something has changed. Their body has awoken again, and they crawl to the top of the ball pit and climb out. But something has happened. The broken-down pizzeria around them is gone, and it's been replaced with something new and rebuilt. Were they moved? Was it moved? They are confused. Andrew is becoming agitated and scared. Jake tries to calm him down. They get to their feet and shuffle along until they realize that this isn't their body. Something that becomes all too clear when they finally find a reflective surface and find that there's a grinning face with milky white eyes staring back. It's not over. Roxy makes it everyone else's problem. Sure, she cries in private, but she's more than willing to lash out with the same insults that we know would break her. Though, as I just said with her defeat, perhaps there is an amount of self-destruction here. Pride comes before the fall, and it's hard to say anyone falls harder than Roxy does. My face! My face! My face! Well, maybe Monty. I do not come up here anymore. I miss him. I gotta be frank here but I think this line is pretty much the best thing in Security Breach. And I don't mean that as a negative or throwing shade away. This line is perfect. The delivery, the tone, the brevity, it gets across so much in one instant, both about Freddy and his relationship with Bonnie. It's funny how you can go through long explanations about a character or their history or all these intersecting plot lines and pull apart what they might mean looking for an answer and then just have one really well-choreographed line gives just as much information in a split second. Except it just hits differently. One of his lines might hint at something else. I'm talking about the ever-popular You can hide, but you can't hide. This could suggest that Monty's just a little bit of a meathead. Not really much to say on that, admittedly. You know what? It kind of reminds me of 8 from 9, a fierce character of few words because most of his lines, too, were cut from the final product. Life just sucks when you're not one of the little and cute ones. Bonnie got up there, realized he couldn't leave the Pizzaplex with his programming, so he decided to get decommissioned so he could swoosh out. So he goes and he sees Monty and asks him to break him, and in return, he'll probably replace him. And Monty agrees. Unfortunately, years of untapped anger and himbo energy causes him to smash in Bonnie's face in one blow. Bonnie is knocked into a coma of which he cannot awaken, dreaming of beautiful rolling hills in his endless slumber, while Monty, wrecked by guilt, is forced to perform and this leads to him lashing out. The only way this could work is if the anniversary image of Glitchtrap, Burntrap, and Fanny wasn't just being cute about them being the main trio, and instead was outright implying that Burntrap and Glitchtrap were two separate beings. Admittedly, I don't think that's what they were going for, but it's worth mentioning. I always found it a little weird that they were considered two separate people. I thought they were kind of taking the cake with that one, but if this is actually a plot point, maybe they weren't. Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor yet again. Um, 
the most likely thing that happened was that Monty, under the control of Fanny or her virus, shattered Bonnie and he was taken down to be used in building Afton's new body. Why Afton would want his body to look like this is totally beyond me. Chica went from a robot with few humanized features to the shapeliness of Toy Chica. And this was long before Hot Charlie, Sexy Baby, the Diddy Babs, Buff Freddy, Buff Helpy, the daycare attendant. But what happens after this point? Well, we have a clue with Shattered Freddy's continued voice lines. Superstar, where are you? Where are you going? Come back. I thought we were friends. Why do you hide? Gregory. Yeah, so Shattered Freddy becomes corrupted and begins to hunt Gregory as well. And Freddy is a formidable foe, especially since this is after he has all of his upgrades, as shown in his model. Gregory unintentionally built the perfect predator by using those parts. And in his broken body, Shattered Freddy fits the bill perfectly. Leave him alone! Gregory, run! Do not look back! Do not watch! Chica, Roxy, Monty, do not listen! Resist her! Please, you do not want to do this. Disassemble, Freddy. No, stop. No, please. <laughs> So I hope that cleared up some things. Thank you for watching. No, I will not be bringing up Buff Helpy. Now, in the fourth closet, the place where all bad FNAF ideas go to Mulder, Funtime Foxy and Mangle are effectively turned into the same character. Not effectively, they're turned into the same character. However, while I made a debate about it in the Mangle video, at this point I've come to terms with the fact that this is just an aesthetic choice. Don't get confused. The most likely outcome is that Funtime Foxy and Mangle are just different models of the same character, like Freddy, Freddy, and Freddy. Henry is only talked about sort of briefly in the Silver Eyes, but isn't given like a character deep dive. So suddenly it's in this book's best interest to bring Henry back and go into his tragic story and his character motives and talk all about Henry, who might not even be dead. Hello? I don't remember this line in the book. But in the final hour, someone decided it would be better if Vanessa acted like an overly aggressive, animatronic, abusing, child-hating loudmouth. And I don't know if it's because they thought the audience would catch on to the twist, or thought people wouldn't realize she's the villain, or wanted to do that whole aggressive woman to entice the audience. I mean, come on, you already had the person who designed this design the entire glam rock band and Vanny. You don't need to make her mean is a foxy endoskeleton in Henry's garage, which Charlie, the main character, was afraid of as a child. This leading to her fear in her later confrontation with Foxy. However, in the fourth closet, it was retconned that this foxy endoskeleton was actually the fourth version of Charlie or Circus Baby. I think these two pictures speak for themselves. Or they would if you could actually see them. Another important endoskeleton would be the robot that Henry built to end his life. In the graphic novels, it's depicted as looking like Endo 2 and carrying what has to be a steel short sword. But a bitter side of me resents Lefty's creation for another reason. That he is the reason we didn't have a proper puppet in FNAF AR. Or perhaps a puppet in Security Breach's prize counter. Or even in Pizzeria Simulator. Even if that's not the case, Something about the dazed look in his eyes of this walking nightmare fuel wasted on the suffering brewing inside him makes me want to blame him. Yes, Fazbear Entertainment has apartments. The world's worst business management organization is now the world's worst landlord conglomerate. The three are introduced as one, two, and three, but are later renamed Gemini, Rose, and Olive. Gemini's the one with the blue twin tails, Rose is the one always shoving food in her mouth, and Olive is the smart one. The Alfredo Incident So the Pizzaplex cracks down ridiculously hard on its employees. They get on an employee named Jenkins for not replacing urinal cakes after a single use, which doesn't make any sense and would lead to a massive inflation of urinal cake purchases, and Elsa for showing up to work early. No doubt because Vanessa stamped her foot and stuck her lips out. 
but one employee was unfairly let go because of Lily H., an unknown person who has an unwieldy amount of power in the company. Assumed to be a fussy child or teen, her name is known by employees around the Pizzaplex. She demands Chicken Alfredo, which the employee says they don't have. Her father, whose name is unknown, throws a fit and summons the manager, Dennis. Dennis asks the employee why they didn't get her Chicken Alfredo, to which the employee says they don't have it, and then is promptly fired. Dennis then tries to get a staff bot to make it, but they don't know how, because the Pizzaplex doesn't have it. Dennis is later fired by higher-ups. So this semi-useless story's punchline is that by the time Gregory enters the Pizzaplex and we're playing as him, Chicken Alfredo is on the menu. It stands out like a sore thumb, but apparently this unknown Lily H has such a draw with the company that Fazbear Entertainment rather bow to her whim and serve it than refuse and risk her spending $30 on something else. Which you know she would. I know her kind. So maybe, maybe if people keep talking about him, maybe if he gets a little bit of a cult following, well he has a cult following, maybe if he gets a bigger cult growth, maybe we will someday see him again. In fact, get John Mulaney to voice him. It'll be a hit. Hey, I'm gonna bust you up, Plum Fum, and then I'm gonna wear your clothes. That was weird. One thing that will make me happy. Oh, what's that? All of the magic in the world. <laughs> For me, and no one else gets any. Is that so much? Yes! Agree to disagree. Pretty boss flamethrower, right? Fred Bear assures his victim that this time it is not an illusion. He doesn't say hallucination, he doesn't say nightmare. He says specifically illusion, and when there's so many words and that one word just happens to an equate to an actual plot element in the book based off of the game where you originated, something just makes sense. But again, this is as far as confirmations go with FNAF, it's all very circumstantial, but that doesn't mean it means much of anything at all. Look at the sun, look at the sun! Bonnie's been out of commission way longer than he has, unless this is a surprise prequel somehow. Don't ask how, it's overly complicated to explain and it's not great. If you've seen my Shattered Freddy video, I talked a lot about the nuance and buildup, the story ramifications, and the change of gameplay that would have made him so cool. Would have made the story of Security Breach have some sort of a real emotional payoff to it, or anything that wasn't just serviceable. Having him just dropped into the DLC and chase you around, it's a good way to look at the model, but I can tell you now, it's not going to be anywhere near as impactful as it could have been. They didn't add Shattered Freddy back into the game. They reused assets that they were making for a section of the game for new means, and for that, I'm not going to act like I'm even vaguely impressed. Unless he doesn't have a head, but he is in fact not the only golden bear in this game. If Golden Freddy is the only animatronic on the field and you manage to get a death coin and use it, and hopefully have the animatronic spawning DD blocked from summoning anyone else, you will be confronted by none other than Fredbear. Fredbear greatly resembles a recolored Freddy, slightly edited to look a little more like Golden Freddy. His audio is garbled, but apparently some people think they hear certain phrases. I'm going to let you listen to the lines first without knowledge of the assumed translation, and then tell you what the assumed translation means. That was apparently, let's find a suit that's right for you. Here's the next one. That was, apparently, be sure to come back soon. Here is the last one. That was, apparently, there's more fantasy and fun where I came from. Though, it is also important to keep in mind how much more additional information would be required to explain certain scenarios and whether they could fit it into this DLC. Unless, of course, we got a Hello Neighbor brand non-ending. Anywho, I hope I enlightened you on this video primarily about... in... sinkholes. 
I mentioned once that the blob is like if someone wanted to do an homage to No Face from Spirited Away but didn't really know much about what exactly was going on with him, had like just saw a clip of him without full context. The blob is lefty in an almost completely perfect homage to No Face, a masked spirit who consumes too much of the greed and decadence around him until he becomes an enormous mound that can do nothing but blindly gorge. Once docile towards children, it is now dangerous because it cannot resist itself or its own impulses. That's not normal. The ultimate failure of Pizzeria Simulator not being that Afton would inevitably return and that those who opposed him were all killed, but that something just as awful slinked right under the radar. What we thought was the end was actually the beginning of something new and much worse. Here stands the new face of Freddy Fazbear's built by the original creator himself. And that's why the blob should have been lefty. Carlton and Lamar follow behind as he reaches the door, forces it open, and rushes in. There he finds Charlie, slumped against a wall near the back of the closet, right in front of the open lockbox. He pushes a prop off of her and kneels down beside her to check if she's breathing. Charlie is alive, but is unconscious having passed out due to exhaustion, overheating, and poor air quality. He breathes a sigh of relief and starts to gather her in his arms as Carlton and Lamar arrive. He tells them that they need to get her to the first responders and to a hospital, and that she might be suffering from smoke inhalation. Something shifts. John's head snaps back to the lockbox. John, Carlton says. That thing just moved. Suddenly, the prop that John had pushed aside lurches upright, lifting up from the ground as though dragged by an invisible force until it can get its long legs underneath itself. They wobble under the weight of its slender body as it raises to full height, towering over the young men. John stares up in horror at a porcelain face broken to a gaping grin. It stares back, unblinking, unrelenting. It's like nothing he's ever seen before. It's Sammy. The DLC for Security Breach is about to release in likely less than a month's time. This would be Project Chowda, or Security Breach Ruin. And it's going to be awful. It will be the worst game of the year. It's going to kill Roxanne Wolf and the daycare attendant, and then it will retroactively erase your favorite animatronics from existence. It will also brick your computer and sell your private information online. It will delete your entire Steam library, except for Golem, and you will be forced to pay microtransactions to buy each game back. Upon the release of Ruin, the FNAF fanbase will go to war with itself, and then everyone will collectively leave the fanbase. And because of this, the FNAF movie will be cancelled and become lost media. Ruin is just going to be that much of a disaster. Trust me, my uncle works at Nintendo. The funny part is that technically Ruin did kill off Roxy and the daycare attendant, in a way. Roxy's was a fake-out, and Sun and Moon were compressed into Eclipse, so yeah, that joke prediction was actually kind of true. Ennard is quite literally nothing but exposed wiring, and with the whole scooping room thing, yeah, Ennard's a walking hazard. But he is quite sympathetic. He too is trapped down here, but in a worse state and with no chance of escape. It's been out before, but it is always broken up and put back eventually. Whether we see Ennard as a hive mind or a culmination, he is a clown who exists in a state where he can never attend a birthday party. He will never be a true clown. Is he cute? Well, he has eyes and a face, so like Mangle, um, yeah, he's cute. So that leaves Ennard with... I'm just gonna give Ennard an 8. Smooching Ennard would be like kissing that tangled up mess of computer cords that you've left behind a dresser for so long that it has ensnared that scary clown doll that Grandma brought you one year, and instead of, you know, Trying to do something about it, you decide to risk the danger of your health and smooch it. Is that a spark of something more between you? Or are you about to go into cardiac arrest? Reeling in animatronics out of the depths of the Red Lake, right under the nose of the one old man consequences and dumping them almost directly into your lap. She is that much of a hassle, and the only way to keep her from showing up is to waste a boost keeping her out for the night. The biggest irritation with Edie Dee is that if you want to play on a specific layout of animatronics and you put their points too high with too few animatronics, she will be triggered. There's no time for that. Mac gets home feeling rough, unknowing that he is going into labor until he starts feeling pain and pressure. 
and looks down to see something moving around in his stomach, trying to push out of the skin. He grabs a kitchen knife and cuts himself open, as one typically does in this situation, and out pops a baby spring trap. Not to be confused with plush trap, that calls Matt daddy and cuddles up to him as he dies. I don't think you die from this, admittedly. People have been cut open in accidents and survived for a surprisingly long amount of time afterwards. But whatever, he's sick. Maybe he hit an artery while filleting himself. The police and Jason find him later, but there's no sign of the baby spring trap. Though Jason does notice a lump of slimy green fur soaked in mucus and amniotic fluid. Now imagine reading that as a child in third grade. So FNAF did a line of little die-cast race cars, and they were cute. The characters were done in chibi designs and each in their own tailored race car. Freddy's in a microphone, Golden Freddy's in a pizza oven, Toy Chica in a cake slice, Cupcake in a cupcake pan, Foxy in a pirate ship, Lolpit in a computer monitor, and the puppet in his box. An innard in the exotic butters basket. This little innard butter car combo is one of the cutest things I've seen come out of this franchise. I love this precious little bab. Here's mine. Remember when I said the exotic butters joke went on too long? I was wrong. Look at this guy. He is worth every cameo that falls flat. Him and that headcanon that enters like really into butter that you'll see in the fandom. Sun and Moon's changed port. Their eyes are also different than they used to be, though that could be from their broken state. Not only is Roxy's facial endo different, you might believe that's a mask, but her well, that is badly is different. The common belief is that this character we'll talk about later is Burn Trap, but his endo does not match Burn Traps either. There's stuff for Faz wrenches all over, and though you can maybe say Vanessa installed all of these systems, Cassie is familiar with the Faz wrench, so they existed before, ergo why Sun's sudden port is so noticeable. Cassie herself changed design before the first trailer and the game, or the first teaser in the game, and this red-eyed creature assumedly never appeared in-game. From how this is set up, that would mean that Vanessa and Gregory left, and nobody repaired the animatronics from their decommissioning and made only meager efforts to repair before it was completely abandoned. But this was so recently that Gregory and Cassie are still kids. And yet somehow, this meager detail upon all of the other changed details is supposedly telling us that this is a completely different Freddy who was damaged in the same exact way when the same ending is considered canon instead of Oh, I don't know, adding this little detail on to explain why Freddy is so advanced. Let that soak for a second. And to add a little more salt to the wound, to have this Freddy be a different Freddy, Freddy would have had to lose his head, had his body removed, Fazbear Entertainment would have to bring in a new Freddy even though they didn't repair any of the other animatronics, abandon him, then he would have had to have lost his head in the same exact way and got the exact same damage as Freddy in the ending. That doesn't compute. And to add on top of that, because I've heard people say, oh, this is just another Freddy from the Pizzaplex, remember that in Security Breach, Vanessa said that they would replace Freddy with Monty until they could put his casing on another endo. So no, there aren't more than one Freddy walking around, likely why Bonnie was so quickly shafted instead of just getting a new one out there. I just needed to put this up because of all the things you can make a convoluted theory on, this is not one of them. And the problem with this is this is just a result of people wanting to, people not being content with how Security Breach ended. Bruin finally went out on a limb and said what ending was canon. It actually said something in concrete for once. And the way that theorizing works with FNAF, well, nothing can be concrete. If I don't like this one twist, I'll just say it never happened. Because Fazbear Entertainment made up all the old games, so I can just say anything was a hallucination, anything was fake, anything wasn't real. But in this context, having to go out of your way to believe something completely different from what we actually know doesn't make sense. But the most significant thing in his room is a poster up on the wall which has been signed by Freddy. It reads, you and me forever and ever. Love, Freddy. So maybe I'm reading too much into this, but that wording mixed with Freddy's sorrow makes me think that maybe Freddy and Bonnie were a little closer than friends. Just the context of that message is very... pretty apparent that Cassie might have trouble making friends. 
Throughout her journey through the Pizzaplex, she sees a lot of stuff, has a sizable breakdown, cries a little, meets my child, and eventually winds up in the basement and turns off the security system to find Gregory, who is actually the mimic pretending to be him. He almost grabs her when Roxy is awakened by the power of love, or perhaps the power of coolness, and buys Cassie time to get away. Though keep in mind that they are not animatronics. There's no AI, period. These are just like smooching oversized old teddy bears. In general, I would give the mascots as a collective unit a 5. They're not traditionally dangerous, they can't fight, but they are old rotting suits that could be carrying all sorts of deadly mold on them. They're not especially cute, but arguably slightly cute. They can't feel anything, again, oversized teddy bears, save the fact that they've got a semi-uncanny valley look. But how do they stack up against each other? First is the Jersey Lion mascot, a lion in a letterman jacket with a neat mane and a tear in its belly. He isn't too bad, but he's a little uneasy on the eyes, but he looks just goofy enough to balance it out. The problem is that he's just so much fabric and cotton that, yeah, if he, they are molding, then he is the moldiest. Again, I'm not really sure why that was the most watched section. Nothing really spicy about that. Here's the runner-up, which is more what I would expect. This blasted rabbit throwing all sorts of stuff at you, watching as he smooch every bot in the Pizzaplex and somehow survive, he hates you. You hate him by now, likely because he keeps slamming metaphorical doors in your face. But as you run out of animatronics to smooch, you realize he is the last, and you really, assuming you survive the mimic. He is the last, and you confront and proposition. At this point, he's likely going to agree to it. Somewhere in his robot brain, he realizes that the faster you get out of here, the better. So, the smooch is on. You throw on the mask and lean in, and it feels like smooching the mask. But there's something to it. This smug rabbit, this rival you could never beat, the animatronic you wouldn't smooch. You have finally won. You have beaten the rabbit, even if he's still looking at you like he's about to drop something heavy on your head. Imagine it like shaking hands at the end of a long game. Except you're planting one on rabbit-shaped spyware. There's also this hideous Wendigo entity that's speculated to be, and likely is, Beta Mexis. I wouldn't smooch it. Spinning his legs over his head, dancing back and forth from foot to foot, slowly slinking around the room, and even swimming in the air when riding on his line. One of the coolest animations is when Moon is crawling with his legs backwards, and then jumps into a somersault, rights himself, and gets back up on his feet. As much of a threat as Moon should be, his movements are less scary monster on the prowl and more cartoon villain coming to tickle you, especially with the wiggly fingers. Withered Bonnie only has one arm, Withered Chica can barely move, the only one putting up a fight is Withered Foxy, and that's him up against Dump Truck Hot Chicken Chipmunk Trash Pile Sock Monkey and the one from Beyond the Sleepless Veil. He is the plastic bear whom nobody likes, whom toddlers kick the shins of, and who is constantly in a state of suffering. Toy Freddy is both a tragic and comedic character, one who may deserve a hug, but then he gives you that look and suddenly you take it back. And my last point here is that Helpy isn't evil, because the person who is whispering in Cassie's ear isn't Helpy. But something else happened in Help Wanted. This was where the Biddy Babs were effectively replaced, arguably replaced. That is, Another baby-shaped tiny troublemaker came into the fold and began to get a surprising amount of appearances in the spotlight compared to the scraps the Biddy Babs scraped by with. And these characters were the plush... And these characters were the plush babies. Ballora is brought into parts and serviced by two technicians and then sent into the scooping room where Mike is. The audience and Mike then watches Ballora is scooped before their very eyes. Baby... Baby then opens the faceplates and warns Mike to manage the spring locks under someone until someone reaches him, all while many Rena's climb on him. So if I may, real big shock, but Night 4 isn't just a disaster gameplay-wise, but a total derailing of the plot. But I digress. It should be known that this isn't the only time a baby variation has been designed like this. Eleanor's design is purposefully a skinny baby with some notable features up top. But it's not too bad, unless we're talking about this Eleanor, Streetwalker baby. And I'm not against breasts, I am a woman who can admire a nice chest. It is, again, 
all of the weird implications surrounding it that makes it feel so wrong. The biggest being that we should not be sexualizing the toddler clown. Bob writes, Hot take, Henry's speech was not that impactful in the grand scheme of things, especially because he arguably made the problem worse. Also, he looks like a minion. I like the hot take videos. Keep on rocking, not real name. Thank you. But I don't know what you mean by him looking like a minion. He sort of looks more like... Oh my god, you're right. To keep it short, you're the band involves a mother who's trying to save her kid who got possessed by an old Freddy head that she bought him for his birthday. In her attempts to save him, and find out more once he disappears, she is assisted by a strange man who's been poking around. This is, in fact, Mike, who knows more about Freddy's than he lets on. She and he head to the old Freddy's where her son is being kept and go up against the leftover animatronic band and even the puppet itself, until the mother returns ahead and the animatronics go docile again. Her son is freed. Mike kind of brings her up to speed, kind of, as they leave, and it's a happy ending for everyone involved. And yeah, this Mike aligns perfectly with the Mike everyone wants as the main character. He knows what's going on, he's actively assisting in these animatronic mysteries, and he's not afraid to go up against the bots. Except the puppet. He sees the puppet and screams like a little lad. But like, who wouldn't? I find that... cute. My god, we actually have a Mike that makes me feel things. Also, Gooseworks confirmed that she is 25, and that number jumped to 34 so fast. Uh-oh, looks like something's crawling through the hole again. Time to move, the hole's getting bigger. Um, in any case, that's Nightmarian. We can't tell for certain if this insecurity and aggression came from his declining mental state, or if he always had this chip on his shoulder. Recently, Gooseworks revealed a little more about Kofmo's character during Glitch X 2020. 2023. During Glitch X 2023. Apparently. <laughs> Testing. Apparently, if Kofmo was, or would have been made, and made it into the final cast lineup, he would have been similar to Ragatha. There's not too terribly much to say here, but it's really cool. It's great to see Moon getting a little more time seeing him ducking and weaving around in an unsettling fashion. If there's one thing that the daycare attendant does well, it's move. That didn't come out sounding right. Oh, um. It's also tethered to the ceiling by wires, and this might be a reference to Tales from the Pizzaplex. Tales' book's tree of wires controlling everything, Mimic Control, Mimic 1 program, Tiger Man inside glass tube, Afton Replicant, Always Come Back, Old Daddy's Bye Bye Baby I'm Going All the Way to the Top, Trap, Wolf Hacks, Child Snatch, and Whack Job. To say a few words. Help Wanted 1's models weren't bad. Well, not all of them, but these ones definitely lack that Play-Doh innard look. <laughs> Ugh. Ooh, I think there was something funny in that hippie. People of Earth! Ooh, that hippie's starting to kick in. We have all learned an important lesson today. I realize now that... Dude, my hands are huge. Whoa! At this point, Shattered Bonnie is beyond ruined. He's clambering back up onto the lane one more time. An arm reaching out in front of him, reminiscent of Burn Trap's constant reaching. Gregory is looking on in fear because his ball hasn't returned yet. But then we see Freddy reach and grab his own ball and then step in front of Gregory, who looks up in surprise. We cut to Freddy staring down the lane at the remains of Bonnie with a somber look. Yes, the Glamrocks do emote look in the intro. There's a cut to us seeing Bonnie's twisted face. There is no remorse. Its eyes are lifeless. Freddy gets a determined look and lifts his bowling ball to his face to take aim. It is in the second that we see the name engraved on the red bowling ball. It is Bonnie's. Freddy takes a swing and rolls the ball straight down the middle, hitting Bonnie dead on and forcing him back into the pin setter one last time, where it crunches him and crushes him. His broken body shudders as he slides into the darkness at the end of the lane. He's gone. Here is the story in full. You, main character, purchased a starter kit to open your own Freddy's. 
In the daytime, you mess around with your restaurant, and at night, you drag in an animatronic from the alley, salvage it, and then do the night segment. Then after five days, one night ends differently. Scrap Baby comes on and goes on a little tirade about how you, the main character, were a pawn, and that this pizzeria was made to give children to the animatronics. She then says, I will make you proud, daddy. To you. But you're definitely not her daddy. He's in the rotten rabbit suit two rooms over. Then an unknown man comes on and reveals that Baby's only half right. This whole place was built as a trap to lure in the rest of the animatronics so that he can end Freddy's once and for all. He talks about the souls trapped in suits, he refers to Baby as Elizabeth, he tells Will he's going to hell, and he reveals that the puppet is his daughter. And unless you've got a completely different ending, you don't know the puppets in Lefty, even then the... And unless you got a completely different ending, you don't know the puppets in Lefty. He then says that you weren't supposed to be here, but he has a hunch that you want to be here and that everyone's going to go together and finally rest. The place burns down and then we hard cut to the graves of the missing children who apparently weren't released in FNAF 3? FNAF 3 just lied to us. Or maybe they were and we just, I don't know, decided to look at their graves for some reason. Then the game ends, or well, the ending finally stops. Happy Frog, Ned Bear, and Pig Patch all cameo on a couple of arcade machines. Ned Bear, the Space Soldier, and Funtime Fantasy. Ever want to see a sexy frog? Well, here you go. Frog legs are on the menu tonight, folks. By the way, speaking of the daycare attendant, let's talk about the not really but sort of confirmation that Moon is a servant of Glitchtrap and or Vanny. I think that Moon being Vanny's claw in the crane game is blatant enough. This alone kind of outright says, yeah, Moon is Vanny's puppet. My favorite part of watching the progression of my videos is seeing the same weird hiccup appearing in the second to last video as in the second one. That's... that's something alright. That explains why he has glitch traps beckoning animation and security breach. That explains why Ruin says the daycare used to be a nice place to nap and now isn't. It explains the red on red thing. Yeah, that's... That's likely it. Now, my most recent video didn't have a most watched moment processed yet, so I'm going to provide what is likely one of the contenders for that title. So basically your task is to help Roxy get to looking good by applying her admittedly terrible makeup. I mean, come on, having two different eyeshadows is a vibe, but having only one eye shadowed is an accident. And the accessories range from cute to cool to absolutely hideous. I mean, Roxy can make anything work, but somebody's going to get fired if Roxy shows up on stage looking like she got blasted by Homer Simpson's makeup shotgun. Could pull a better clip show out of my... Um, <clears throat> wasn't that a great show? A real strange group of clips, admittedly. Though now I've got a better idea of what parts of my videos are watched the most, and maybe even what you would like to see in the future. So expect the sexiest animatronic rankings sometime soon. I have a hunch you guys will be into it. But in all seriousness, here's to another good year. Thank you for sticking around, and I can't wait to see what we're going to experience together in the coming year. And thank you for watching.